Well, good morning. I want to take a moment to welcome you, those here in person, those watching online. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mike Tropea. I serve on board here as the executive pastor, and I'm excited to be sharing with you this morning. I pray you had a great uh, New Year's uh, holiday season, good Christmas. Uh, this time of the year can bring up a lot of different emotions in people. Some people are excited. Some people, this brings different emotions to no matter where you find yourself during this time, my, my heart is that you hope in the one who hasn't changed. Hope in the one who held our 2021 and will hold our 2022. That he is never changing in, in an ever-changing world, but we can cling to him because he is good. And so as we just started off in praise to our great God, I'd love to just pray as a body real quick to say let's start our 2022 off in prayer and just let that lead our days and months and years ahead that this year we can be set off in praise and prayer. So let's pray as a body. God, thank you so much that your great news continues to go ahead of us, that we serve a God that knows us individually and carries the whole world in his hands and it, nothing surprises you. God, as a church family, I ask that the best days be ahead of us, that we can live in light of your good news today, that it can change our hearts today to look a little more like you, as Elijah has previously said. Because if we grab a hold of knowing you deeper in 2022, better than we did in 2021, I can guarantee you will work in deeper and truer ways throughout our body and throughout our area where you've placed us. God, we need you. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, during this time of the year, we are flipping the calendar. We are changing from one year to another. And generally, in the past year, since I've been here for four years, we've done a series for the first two weeks called New Beginnings. During this time of new beginnings, uh, we often put out, especially as culture at large, resolutions. Resolutions about how we want to step into this new year. And I don't know how you have done with resolutions, but my resolutions usually last about 15 days out of the year. I eat good for 15 days and the rest of them carb load in the rest of my year. <laughs> but my heart has transitioned to want to go away from uh, new resolutions to one or two routines a year. How can I discipline myself in 2022 in one or two specific ways and have a new beginning in routines of my life? And so today, what I want to talk about to you is a new routine and a new posture I want to start 2022 off with, and I, I want to challenge you in the same way. And when I say the word, you're immediately going to think of one specific thing, but I, I just say, stick with me. In 2022, I pray that our routine of generosity is at the forefront of everything we say and do. And when I say generosity, our, a lot of times our immediate thought goes to giving money financially. And although, that, although that's a part of generosity at large, I don't want to talk about that aspect of our generosity. I want to talk about what the Bible says is our posture of generosity at large that encompasses, yes, our finances, yes, our time, yes, our gifts, but also the intangible things God has called us to step into with how we live our lives in 2022. And so let's turn to what the Bible, our, our book about how we know God, what it says about generosity. In Proverbs 11, verses 24 through 26, you'll see it right behind me. It gives us a picture of what biblical generosity is. It says this, one who gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back rain, who withholds what he should give, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. This posture of biblical generosity is this posture of open hands. 
taking everything God has given us as a gift, our money, our time, and how we live as an open-handed gift to say, hey God, how can I give it back for your glory and our good? How can I invest what you have given me in a way that brings eternal impact instead of temporary pleasure? And one of the, the first real evident signs of generosity in my life was when uh, I was 17 years old. In 2004, I'm dating myself. Um, 2004, I was 17 years old. I got saved at the age of 17. And I was invited to, uh, a, on a mission trip to Northern Ireland, uh, to Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I had to raise $3,500 to go on this trip. And I don't know about you, but at 17 years old, $3,500 is a lot. Today, that still seems like a lot. I don't know about you, but that is. And I, I wasn't one to sell world's finest candy bars or magazine subscriptions to raise money. I just wanted to either work to go there. And so I, I had to raise $3,500. And so coming upon Christmas Eve in 2004, uh, there was my, one of these first radical genero generosity that I experienced was uh, we celebrating at my grandparents' house in 2004. And so right before we start eating, my grandparents had hand all the uh, grandchildren a gift uh, in an envelope. And I open it up, and there's 10 $100 bills in the envelope. And I'm like, I'm like ugly crying already because I, I just haven't received anything like that up until that point. And I was like, this is going toward, I'm, I'm on my way. I'm on my way to the mission strip to be able to go. And so we get done eating the traditional Italian meal. And at the end of the, of the evening, we get another envelope. And it has 10 $100 bills in it as well. $2,000, my grandparents had, were redoing their estate and getting everything in line. And they were generous to me with money to be able to go on this mission trip. So I ended up raising and working for the rest of that money. And I was on my way in the summer of 2005 to Northern Ireland, Belfast. And if you know anything about the background of Northern Ireland, there's a lot of turmoil and tragedy uh, between the people of Belfast, Northern Ireland. So there was, back in the uh, late um, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was um, a difference between Protestants and Catholics in fighting. And then it really turned internal. Protestants against, fighting against Protestants, neighborhoods against neighborhoods. So trauma had riddled the past of this people. And so in 2005, the effects of that trauma still existed. And I met a kid by the name of Jack. He was 11 years old. You would have thought he was the happiest kid ever, just the way he was excited to see Americans and play soccer with them. And we partnered with a Youth for Christ house uh, during that week. And I got to know Jack. I got to know his story. And underneath the, the smile, there was a father who had... Um, been a part of a lot of this trauma from infighting and a brother that was a part of a military. And even while we were there, we were on lockdown one day because there was a murder, murder three houses down from where we were serving that week because of the par uh, paramilitaries that were fighting one another. And so Jack took a lot of this on in his 11-year-old self. And I got to spend time paying attention and understanding what he struggled with. And come up to the last day of that time there, I got to share the good news of Christ to say, hey, that history doesn't need to be your future. The good news of the gospel is Christ paid for all that trauma so you can live with a purpose and a meaning far beyond what you've experienced and you can live in light of the good news of the gospel. And the beautiful opportunity that my grandparents gave gen generously to me to go allowed me to be generous with my compassion, my attention, and the message that I was able to share with Jack that week. And that's what I want to talk about today. To have the routine of generosity in our compassion for people, generosity in our attention towards their true need, and generosity with sharing the gospel hope and message with a world that desperately needs it. And I want to look at one specific episode of Christ's walk, Christ's life, that many of us know. And it's, it's the episode of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, where Christ displays this radical generosity with his life. And if we take this to heart and implement this idea of open-handedness with everything God has given us, our 2022 will be a great year. 
And so let's read together as a church family. I'm gonna read the whole account from John 4, 7 through 29, so buckle up. It's a lot of reading, but it's good. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. I love this line. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, come. See a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? It's a powerful, powerful story when you understand the context in which Christ was speaking into things. And the first point I wanna make regarding this generosity, this posture of generosity and how we can model it and have a new beginning is this, we need to be generous with our compassion. Generous with our compassion. What you don't know or what you may know about this story is that Jesus was crossing radical barriers to have this one appointment with this woman. So what traditionally during this time happened, this was a Samaritan woman. And if you know anything about the history of that time, Jews had nothing to do and wanted nothing to do with Samaritan people at large because they weren't fully Jewish, but they weren't fully Gentile. They were a mixed people. And so Jews would often go the route of Judea in the south and go around over the Jordan River to the east and around to get to Galilee instead of going through because they wanted to avoid all the Samaritan people at all costs. But Jesus had an appointment. He had a plan that God divinely responded to and said, go there. So he crossed racial boundaries to understand, see, and get to know this woman. He also crossed gender boundaries because a man in that time would never have been alone with not only a Samaritan woman, a woman, a woman at, at large alone in that space. That's why it says at the end they marveled that he was with a woman. So he crossed not only racial but gender boundaries to go and understand the, this person's story. And I don't know about you, but that in and of itself shows some compassion, right? Compassion really means kindness and sympathy towards, and in the Latin, it's compati, which means to suffer with. 
Jesus came alongside this woman who he got to know and he suffered alongside her. He didn't look down with sympathy. He came alongside and said, I want to get to know you and understand what's truly going on. He was generous and open-handed with his compassion towards this woman. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, theologian in the uh, early 1900s, puts it like this. We must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or omit to do and more in light of what they suffer. Let me repeat that. We must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or omit to do and more in light of what they suffer. What he's saying there is Jesus didn't just look at that she had five husbands, look that she was a woman, a Samaritan. He went to the heart and saw that she was made in the image of God. And he suffered alongside and loved her alongside to say, I, don't, I know what you truly need. And it's not this water. It's living water. It's living hope that only I can provide. I don't know if you, how you would have responded to this situation, but I would probably would have labeled her adulterers. I probably would have had my own labels in this time and space like the culture would, has inputted into me. I don't know if I would have postured myself like Jesus did, but I pray I do. I pray I put myself in a position to be generous with compassion, to suffer alongside her. Because that's what my Christ would have done. How would you have responded in the same situation? Would you have looked at her sin? Would you have known and labeled her? Or would you have come alongside her and suffered alongside her in a compassionate way? And so what has your narrative been in 2021? Has it been a posture of generosity and compassion in walking alongside those who are broken or understanding deeply the heart of of the people you have in your life? Or have you been generous with your critique? Have you been generous with your labels that you have placed on people? And Ken, in 2022, can we be generous and put ourselves in a position to be generous with our compassion and walking alongside people with love and care, to walk, mourn with those who mourn, who are broken with those who are broken. Can we effort and routine ourselves to do that, church? Not only that, Jesus was generous with his attention. He was generous with his intention. Dallas Willard, an American philosopher and Christian who passed away, in 2013, wrote a lot of books that have influenced me in my personal walk with Christ. He said this statement, the first act of love is always the giving of our attention. The first act of love is always the giving of our intention. And what that statement means is this, you can't really love someone unless you start, you actually know them. Right, Because we have to actually know what they really need, what they really care about, and that requires attention to them, attention to what they actually desire, what they actually need, and that's exactly what Christ did. He didn't speed up to go through, the, through uh, this conversation. He was there, and he often did that with his ministry. If you read other gospel accounts of Christ, do you ever see the picture of every single interaction Jesus had, he was never in a hurry, He was never really distracted. Even when he was amongst crowds of people, a woman grabbed his his robe and he felt power go out of him and he addressed that one person because he was paying attention to the individual person and their individual needs in the moment and he was never in a hurry to get past it. And I'm gonna put uh, men on the spot here. How many of you have listened to your spouse 100% of the time? Raise your hand. Yeah, there's one I was, get, I was gonna tell you, put it down. <laughs> or, or children, how many times have you listened, have you listened to your parents perfectly in everything they've told you to do? Oh, there's one over there. You're lying. Um, <laughs> but the reality is we don't. I, I know sometimes when my wife is communicating with me, and I'm sure this is a similar uh, uh, thing with you, the fact is sometimes I'm literally thinking of nothing but she's like, we get done with the conversation. She's like, do you hear what I said? 
And I heard the and, and did you hear what I said? And the whole conversation is what I actually heard because I wasn't paying attention to what she was saying. I wasn't giving her that, that first act of love of giving my attention to her like I, I am called to do. And Jesus in this interaction, he gives his full attention to what this woman truly needs. And he knows it's not to condemn her. He knows it's, it's the true hope of the gospel that she needs to quench that inquenchable thirst that this world tries to, to satisfy, but it can't. So church, are we, de- are we generous with our attention? One of the things I've been thinking about when I was preparing for this is a quick statement that we can catch, that we can hold on to. And I thought about this. Present people are a present to people. Present people are a present to people. Because I don't know about you, but on a Sunday morning, my role is all around, a lot of times behind the scenes. And people over the past two, three years since I've been here, people come up to me and say, hey, did you, did you remember this? Did you remember this? And I finally gotten to the point where I say, hey, can you email me that? Because I will definitely not remember it after today. Because of all the things I'm doing, all the distractions in life. And a lot of times for me personally, during between Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's crazy in the life of a church. And I saw myself over the past month and a half straying away, distracted from even investing time with my family and my daughter. And it wasn't until this past week when I actually had off where I've got to let my hair down a little bit and rest. And there was this one morning, I think it was Tuesday morning, where my daughter likes to get up crazy early and we don't know why because she, she inherited my earliness in the morning. She gets up at 5.30, maybe six o'clock and I just wanna sleep until seven, please. For one day in seven years since she's been born, I have not been able to sleep past seven o'clock because she gets up always early. And so this was Tuesday morning. I was coming uh, and she woke up at 5.30 and I wanted to go back to bed and I just wanted to sleep. But she's like, dad, can you please do Legos with me at 5.30 in the morning? And I was like, usually we let her, she's really good on her own in the morning and reads books and just hangs out for an hour. And I really wanted to sleep and I was like, yes, I will do Legos with you at 5.30 in the morning. And I sat there put, um, putting uh, Legos together with, for an hour with my daughter. But the beautiful thing about that moment, she, I took that moment to be there, not have my phone around me, not have the distractions and notifications and the mindless scrolling of my phone around me to fill my time. I, she received my whole attention, which she deserves but I have often put that to the side. In church, what my daughter talked about for that last, for a couple times throughout the week of how grateful she was for that. But I, want, I don't want that to be just an every so often. I just want that to be a routine in life where she said her dad is present and attentive to her needs. And so church, today I'm asking you, with the relationships that God has placed in your hand today, are you generous with your attention towards them? Are you generous with your attention towards your spouse, your children, your coworkers, though, those who may annoy you that God has put in your path for a reason to love and care for? Are you generous with your attention to understand what they truly need? Because if we are, if we truly give our attention, we will realize that they might just want our presence and it will be a present to them or they have something deeper that needs to be addressed and we can be there to assist them in understanding what that is. And lastly, we need to be generous with the message. Generous with the message. If you see, if you remember to what we read in John 4, this episode where she was saying, where they were talking about the worshipers, and he was saying, and it's not in, in temples or anything, it's, it's, we worship, worship in spirit and in truth. And she says this idea, I'm waiting for this Messiah. And then what does he say? He doesn't say, uh, go figure it out. He says, I am the one, I am the Messiah you've been looking for. And it changed her whole posture. Why? Because he was generous with the message of hope that we need to be generous with today. We know if you've been in church circles any amount of time, you have heard the line that often and is wrongly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi where it says, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. 
I think that is only halfway there. People lean on that and say, just live a life of Christ-likeness and then they'll know. But I think, I, I don't think I know that's a lie because we need to share this message of hope on an ongoing basis because do you know, do you realize what we've received? The free gift of new life in Christ and what it has done in our lives? So why aren't we freely generous with this? Like Christ was with, to this woman. Because he knew that this is what she needed and we live in a culture and a time that desperately needs hope. And the message of Christ is the only thing that's gonna satisfy and grow them. Romans 10, 14 through 17. If you would take a moment and read it with me. It speaks to this very thought. Paul is speaking to the church in Rome, the church that's gathered in homes throughout Rome. And he says this. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We need to share the gospel, church. We need to share the good news of Jesus Christ because it changed everything. What happened to this woman after she, it was revealed that he was the Christ? She went and told people about it. She wasn't anymore called by her sin which the world and then the, and the circles that she ran with called her by. That's why she was alone at that, at that well because the world had scorned her, but not God, not God himself. He didn't call her by her sin. He called her by her name and the image in which she bared and brought her hope and peace. And we need to do the same. Church, I want to challenge us to look at our 2021 and ask ourselves, how often did we share the good news of Christ? Was it a routine to share with our families, to share with those God has put in our spheres of influence, our coworkers? Have we shared it or we, have we just lived on the sideline hoping that things would change? Or did we verbalize with our communication that these people that God has placed that don't know him are image bearers of God and they just need this hope of Christ to fully live out their purpose and worth in a world that's ever telling them what they are, but in reality, it's never gonna quench their thirst. Only Christ himself is. Are we generous in our routines of sharing the gospel with those around us? Paul Tripp, he's a writer who has a quote that says this, that I pray we cling to. He says this, our hope as Christians isn't in the fresh start of a new year, but in the new beginnings purchased on the cross. Let me repeat that. Our hope as Christians isn't in the fresh start of a new year, but in the new beginnings purchased on the cross. What an easy thought could be going out of here today as people who are believers in Jesus is this. I am going to routine myself and will myself to be generous with compassion, to be generous with my attention and to be generous with the gospel. And my heart is that you don't take that out of here. My heart is that you take the picture of the cross and the gift that was given to us of new life on the cross, you stare at him, behold his goodness, and out of the spirit that has been given to you as you place your faith and trust in Christ, then you give generously with the good news. Then you give generously with your compassion only as you behold the generosity of the Father and the person and work of Jesus. And with his Holy Spirit, you submit to him and can continue to live out this generous routine in 2022. And for those of you who don't know Jesus today, and maybe you identify with the woman at the well, the beautiful thing about all of us here is at one time we did identify as her. 
We were stained, we were broken in our sin. We chose to go our own way, but the beautiful thing of the good news is God continued to pursue us and gave what was at most cost to him, his son, to bear the weight of sin and death and pain so we could have new life and right relationship. And that can be your story where you don't need to be uh, identifying with your sin and your past. You can be identified with the work and the image bearer of God that you were originally created to be in. And that could be your future. That could be your 2022. And to start a new beginning in Christ, just like this woman started a new beginning in understanding and sharing the good news of the gospel that she had been shown. Church, today I believe 2022 can be a great start to a great year if we live in routinely generosity with our compassion, our attention, and the gospel message and if you live in new life in Christ. And I'd love to talk to you about that online. If you're curious about that or in person, I'd love to understand and walk with you towards that end. Can we be generous, church? With everything God has given us, living open-handed life, saying, God, take what you will and make me more and more like your son. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you that you were radically generous towards us. When we were in our sin and despair and choosing everything but the good news of the gospel, you didn't stop. You pursued. And at just the right time in our sin, you gave your one and only son to live perfectly as we couldn't, to die sacrificially as we couldn't do, but then to live in new life triumphantly over sin, death, and the grave. And now we are grateful that that spirit lives in us if we've submitted to you. And God, I pray that 2022 isn't about resolutions, but, but about routines to, and disciplines to live out this generosity on a daily basis to be compassionate and mourn with those who mourn, to give our attention to the people and things you have put in our hands and to be generous with sharing the good news of the gospel with the world around us. And God, I pray for those who don't know you, that 2022 can be a new beginning for a new path for towards eternal life with wells of living water growing in people to better know you and better know their worth and purpose in knowing you. God, we need you be with us. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy, mighty, and strong, strong name. Amen.